Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. He's back again, Dr. Bilal Phillips, to help clear that way. There's some confusion out there. There are many ways calling people saying that they're the correct way. So how does one differentiate the true way of life, the true religion, the true way to be successful from all these thousands, hundreds of ways saying that they're the way. So when he comes out, we're going to try to answer this very crucial question here on The Dean Show. You don't want to go nowhere. We'll be right back. Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Back again on the Dean Show. My pleasure to be back. All right. Alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. People can read about you at thedeanshow.com. You have your own private section. Is that right? That's right. Has wow. your picture there, and they click on the picture, and your bio is there, and the show that we did, Purpose of Life. That's a crucial question. But another question is people are like, you know what? Religions are all the same. They're man-made. I'll just do my own thing. How does one differentiate the true way of life? If one has already acknowledged what's in his very nature, that there's a creator. But now you have all these different isms, these different ways, how do you differentiate what is the true way? The true way to success, happiness, peace, and the pleasure of the creator of the heavens and earth. Talk to us, please. Well, if we're to find the true way, we have to believe, of course, that this true way must have come from God. So, if it's coming from God, it must have what we call a scriptural basis. Mm -hmm. There should be a scripture there. And then that scripture should be one in which there is no doubt. No doubt. No doubt about the authenticity of its text, its origin, the protection of that text from any change or modification, so that we know what is in our hands was what was revealed. Mm -hmm. Then we know we have a religion whose basis, whose foundation is solid. Otherwise, if the document that is claimed to be the origin is something which they've got so many different manuscripts of and no two manuscripts agree with each other, like the Gospels, for example, yeah. there are over 5,000 manuscripts. Mm -hmm. No two manuscripts agree in all details with each other. And at present, we have something like 5,500 manuscripts in Greek of the New Testament, which is a lot for an ancient book. It's far more than any other ancient book. The problem is most of these copies are hundreds and hundreds of years after the originals and all of them have differences in them. Uh, so that the scribes who were copying these manuscripts changed the text that they were copying, uh, sometimes by accident. I mean, sometimes they just made mistakes. They were sleepy or incompetent or whatever. But sometimes it looks like scribes actually thought the text should say something other than it did. And then they, so they would change the text. So then which one's right? How do you figure it out? Yeah. You know, or the Gita or the, you know, scriptures of the Hindus and others, you know. When they were written, they have no idea, bits and pieces here and there. You know, it's of uncertain origin. Who wrote, they don't know. Clouded, clouded in, in, in confusion and uncertainty. Yeah. So when you have texts like that, I mean, even the, the Old Testament, which mm -hmm. may be a little more accurate and more solid than the New Testament writings, but even that, the scholars of scriptural crypt criticism have shown contradictions that exist in it. Uh, some places it looks like it's a manipulation of the text, where, where the author wants to change, where, where the scribe wants to change what the author said. I mean, in many cases, it may be that the scribe thought this is what the author really meant, and so he changed it. But, uh, but sometimes the, the text gets changed to say just the opposite of what it originally said. And so uh, that's, uh, that, that can be a little bit troubling, yeah. Different documents which are being used, stories which are being repeated in you know, different ways and all kinds of doubts there. Yeah. You have doubts. So we can distinguish. We, we just have to put the, the basic scriptures on the table and say, like, which one we can be 100% sure about. And that's the Quran. 
The yeah. evidence is there. It speaks for itself. So it can't have... That is external. Yeah. That's from an external perspective. Yeah. Then internally, uh -huh. what does that text contain? Yeah. Now is that text, if it's from God, it should contain accurate information. It shouldn't have fallacies and, you know, uh, contradictions with modern science and these kinds of things. When you pick up the other texts and you read in there, maybe you might find some interesting things here and there, but there's a lot of old wives' tales which don't agree with what we know about science today. Yeah. Whereas when you go in the Quran, you go from chapter to chapter, when you look at scientific things which are talked about in the Quran, they match modern scientific theory. So much so that when the verses were shown to uh, Dr. Keith Moore, who writ wrote the book on embryology, yeah. Right, the book used in all of the medical colleges around the world. They showed him these verses from the Quran which described the development of the fetus at a time when it's not visible to the naked eye. He said, Muhammad could not have known these facts about human development in the 7th century because most of them were not discovered until the 20th century. That God transmitted through Muhammad bits of his knowledge that we have only discovered for ourselves in recent times. 1,400 years ago, when the world was immersed in darkness, the Quran was revealed, which brought light to a beleaguered world. And whereas the earlier books came with many scientific mistakes due to the hand of man having delved into them, the Quran had none of these contradictions. The world thought there could be no reconciliation between religion and science. But the Quran mentioned many scientific facts in great detail, like how a human being developed in the mother's womb, and described other scientific facts which amaze the world's renowned scientists and scientific community. This could not have come from Muhammad. So they said, then where did it come from? It must have come from God. No doubt. Not possible to describe what is there when the microscope wasn't developed until many centuries after him. Yeah. This is the evidence. These are concrete bits and pieces of evidence that's internal. You have external and you have internal. And then the overall message which is being taught. I mean, it's not a whole bunch of fairy tales, wild, fantastic tales. Things which seem to match the realities of this life. You read the Quran, this is God talking to you directly. So now, so a person doesn't have to go deep into, let's say, Buddhism, Christianity, or any kind of Hindu religion, or all the Sikhism. Now, at the face of it, so they're looking for contradictions, mistakes, things that are unrational. What are they actually looking for? These are some of the things that you mentioned that it has to be, the message has to be lucid, clear, something that is basically not flawed by man. And then if it is, leave it alone, go to the next. Does Islam encourage that you look at these different ways and you'll come to realization, if you're sincere and you're asking the Creator to guide you, that you'll eventually end up back to this way, the way of all the prophets, Islam? If a person is sincere, God is going to guide them. Yeah. That's for sure. If they're sincere. But they have to be ready to act then on the knowledge that they get from this. The mm -hmm. problem is that a lot of people may come and realize, yes, the truth is there with Islam. Yeah. But to take that on, what is involved in, in becoming a Muslim, creates such problems in families, you know, how parents are going to react, how the wife and the kids and, you know, or the husband and the, the kids and how are they going to react? How am I going to deal with so all of this? So some problem. people say, hey, too much. That's the real issue. I, I, I like what you have. Yeah. It makes <laughs> sense. It's very good. But I'm just not ready to deal with the consequences. Consequences. Yeah. And that's sad because one cannot afford once you seek the truth, you know, as it's mentioned in the Bible, the truth is going to set you free. It's mm -hmm. true set you free from ignorance, bring you to the realization of the true God. So once you're there, for you to turn aside and say, well, because of people, I can't deal with this, that's a big mistake. That is the most serious possible mistake that you can make in your life. To have known the truth in its clarity, 